active electrodes. We can use electrochemistry to measure a lot of biological functions. So, for example, you got a critically ill patient. They're willed into the ER. The doctor needs blood chemistry information quickly to help her make a diagnosis. Diagnosis. Every analyte in the table can be measured with electrochemistry. So we can measure conductivity. Uh, we can use conductivity to measure potassium and calcium. Uh, we can use contraction to uh, measure calcium and magnesium. We can measure energy level to measure glucose, PO2, lactate, hemocrit, ventilation with PO2, CO2, perfusion with lactate, O2 saturation, hemocrit, acid base with pH, PCO2, uh, and hydrogen carbonate, osmolality with sodium and glucose, electrolyte balance, you can look at sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, renal function with blood, urea, nitrogenation, and creatine. How are we going to do this? Well, we can do this through the miracle of electrochemistry. So here in figure 5, 1522, uh, what method of choice for determining different blood levels is going to, uh, you're basically going to take your blood in, right, and then you're going to do a series of experiments, right, and then you're going to, you got some sort of reference electrode and your blood goes out. Um, we can look at different methods to determine these different ions. Other ion selective electrodes can measure medicines in blood, such as uh, heparin administered during surgery. It's going to have a series of little sensors that this thing is going to go past. Right? Oxygen and lactate are going to be measured by amperometry. We'll look at that later on in chapter 17. We can do hemocrit, which is a fraction of blood volume consisting of blood cells by electrical conductivity. And hemoglobin can be analyzed using spectrophotometry. Right? Uh, Glass membranes, so classes of ion selective electrodes. We've got glass membranes, which we talked about already. We have solid state electrodes, which are based on inorganic crystals or conductive polymers. Liquid based electrodes, which use a hydrophobic polymer membrane saturated with hydrophobic liquid ion exchanger. And compound electrodes, in which an ion selective electrode is enclosed by a membrane separated by analytes from other species or that generates an analyte in a chemical reaction. So, uh, we need to know about the selectivity coefficient, right? So if I want to measure something, I want to make sure that I am only measuring the thing I am interested in. I do not want to measure something else by accident. Ion selective electrodes are not perfectly selective. Interference can contribute to the overall ion selective electrode cell voltage. Selectivity coefficient gives the relative response of different species with the same charge. So we're going to give it this constant K, right? So what is my response to analyte X divided by the response to analyte A? The smaller the selectivity coefficient, the less interference by X when measuring A. So X bad, A good. In response to an ion selective electrode to its primary ion A and to interfering ions X of the same charge, this is going to look like this Nernst equation again. We've got some sort of constant and we're going to have plus or minus Z is going to be the charge and the log of the activities and then the sum of the uh, X selectivity coefficients of all the things times the concentration of your various interference. It could be either positive or negative depending on whether the analyte is a cation or an anion. So how is selectivity coefficient determined? You're going to prepare calibration curves for the analyte, let's say sodium, and expected interferences. Potassium, calcium, magnesium, they're all going to act like sodium. We're going to choose the selectivity coefficient to calculate. So we're going to look at our uh, K-pot for sodium and calcium. Right? We're going to measure the change in potential in a range where the calibration curve slopes are linear and approximately equal. So we've got this sort of Nernstian response. So our change in potential is going to be equal to our potential for calcium minus our potential for sodium. And in this case, we're going to get minus uh, 363 millivolts. So as our analyte goes up, right, how is its selectivity going to change? Well, if we're looking at sodium uh, here um, as our analyte, right, we're going to see a particular slope of the line over here. If we're going to throw in some calcium, you'll notice that this is going to change a little bit. Right? We've got some interferences. Right, example, I got a fluoride ion selective electrode with a selectivity coefficient of 0.1 relative to hydroxide. What will the change in the electrode potential be 
if I've got 1 times 10 to the minus 4 molar fluoride at a pH of 5.5, and we go raised it to a pH of 10.5. So we're increasing the amount of hydroxide at a higher pH. Our concentration of OH has gone up, and we're going to need to know how much is that going to interfere. So from our equations, we find that the potential with negligible OH minus at a pH of 5 is going to be uh, some sort of constant plus 0.3 or plus 0.2636 millivolts. At a pH of 10, our concentration of hydroxide is significant, it's going to be 3.2 times 10 to the minus 4 molar. So the electrode potential is going to change. So our electrode potential is going to be that constant minus 0.0592 times the log of 1 times 10 to the minus 4 plus 0.1 times 3 times 10 to the minus 4. And this is coming from our hydroxide. And this guy over here was our K. And this guy was our uh, concentration of sodium. So the change is 2.295 minus 236.6 mu which is equal to minus 7.1 millivolts, which is within two orders of magnitude. If you didn't know about the pH change, you wouldn't think that the concentration of fluoride had increased by 32%, right? So it's a pretty big change for a small amount. So test yourself, find the change in potential when one times 10 to the minus four molar fluoride at pH of five is raised to 9.5. All right, solid state electrodes. Solid state electrodes are going to use a slightly different trick than this selective membrane. So in the other ones, we had some sort of selective membrane. We built up a junction potential because we had an outside solution that varied. We had an inside solution that was constant. Here we're going to uh, kind of change the structure of some of our crystals that are down, inorganic crystals that are down here at the bottom, where ordinarily we would find our glass membrane or our semi-permeable membrane. Okay. So we're going to look at a fluoride one. A fluoride ion selective electrode is used to measure the amount of fluoride in municipal water. In the fluoride ion selective electrode, we have this lanthanum fluoride crystal. It is doped with small amounts of europium. That's going to serve as our ion selective membrane. The EU2 plus is going to create vacancies in the crystal that enable a tiny current of fluoride ions to move through the lanthanum fluoride. So you got this europium right over here. Right, this is this guy in gray, and it's going to create a little hole. And some of our fluorides can move into those holes. And when we do that, now a new vacancy occurs, and maybe this fluoride can move. And so if I'm moving charges around, because fluoride has a minus charge, that is a current. So for our ion selective electrode, where we've got this crystal, right? we're going to have a very similar equation. We're going to have uh, our potential is going to be some constant minus some other constant times 0.0592 times the log of the activity of the fluoride on the outside. Right? So we've got some fluoride minus on the outside over here. The only interfering species is hydroxide, for which the selectivity coefficient is 0.1. At a low pH, so it's under acidic conditions where we don't have a lot of hydroxide. The fluoride is converted to HF, to which the electrode is insensitive. And so we're going to measure F minus in a high ionic strength buffer containing acetic acid, sodium citrate, sodium chloride, and sodium hydroxide at about a pH of 5. So if we look at the response curve or a calibration curve for our fluoride ion selective electrode, whereas we're going to change and increase our fluoride ion concentration, Right. So from low to high, right, our potential is going to decrease. We have a nice negative slope on this. But what it lets us do is, hey, if I've got 200 millivolts, I know that my fluoride concentration is going to be a log of about three. Right. When fluoride electrode was immersed in standard solutions maintained at a constant ionic strength of 0.1 molar. The following potentials were observed. So nice little table there. We're systematically changing the order of magnitude of our 
fluoride, we're going to get some millivolts because the ionic strength is constant. The response should depend on the log of the F minus concentration. We can use that to find the fluoride concentration in an unknown that gave a potential of zero volts. Right? So we have enough here to build ourselves a standard curve. Right? We've been given an unknown concentration, but with a measured Y. Right? We're going to fit the calibration with an equation. So we're going to get Y is equal to M times the log of fluoride plus B. You know, y equals mx plus b equation here. Our plotting of potential versus the log of fluoride gives us a straight line with a slope of minus 58.5 millivolts and a y-intercept of minus 192 millivolts. Setting e is equal to zero, we're just going to solve for f. That's we're going to say here, zero. What is this log of f? And we ended up with uh, 5.1 times 10 to the minus 4, so somewhere in between minus 4 and minus 3 as our order of magnitude. See if you can do the same thing with the cell potential of 81.2 millivolts. And then ask yourself, is it still valid for 110 millivolts? Right? 110 up here outside our calibrated range. Table 15.5 summarizes the properties of various solid state ion selective electrodes. Notice that we can uh, detect a wide range of potential ions, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodide, thiocyanate, cyanide, sulfide. Uh, the concentration range is going to go down to the submillimolar level in most cases. In order to do that, we're going to need a different membrane material for each one. Also note that this table contains the pH range over which that measurement is going to be valid. So for some of them, like fluoride here, it's a pretty narrow pH range, which means that you'd have to do some sort of sample preparation to make sure that you're working in the correct pH range. Other thing to notice is that there's interfering species, right? So Hydroxide is going to interfere with the fluoride measurement. Shouldn't be too much of an issue if you're down at that pH, right? For uh, something like bromine, uh, you might have some interferences with iodine, right? So they're two halides. They're probably going to act similarly to each other. So be aware that there can be some interfering species. This table helps us summarize what they are. Um, how you make these things, sometimes just changing the cleavage plane on that crystal can change the response type. So to make an ion selective electrode for hydrogen sulfide, so that's one of our industrial gases, HS, uh, that's what they're going to put into uh, natural gas to make it smell bad. <laughs> so if you need to know if you've got hydrogen sulfide around, this is a type of electrochemical measurement that you could use. You're going to take a cadmium sulfide crystal and you're going to cleave it in such a way as to expose the cadmium planes. If you want to make an ion sulfide electrode for cadmium, you're going to take that same crystal and expose the sulfide planes. Right, so you've got some sulfide planes, yep, and we got some cadmium planes. Just depending on how you slice that guy up, you're going to get different responses. Again, you're seeing this kind of negative slope that happens where your log of your concentration, as you increase your concentration, all right, you're going to end up with an increasingly negative voltage relative to that silver silver chloride reference electrode liquid membrane electrode similar idea as the glass membrane except the membrane is a polymer and it's saturated with a liquid ion exchanger the interaction of the exchanger with the target ions results in a potential across the membrane that can be measured so we'll take an example and look at the calcium electrode so here we've got this porous membrane and a res in green and a reservoir of ion exchanger here in yellow as the cast as the calcium comes into that uh, sensing area, we're going to have some calcium coming up in here. Right? So we got my membrane. The calcium is going to come over to here, and it's going to basically uh, force the exchanger into the membrane. The exchanger is going to form a complex with the target analyte. This results in a concentration and charge gradient with a measurable potential. You're still going to have this reference AGCL electrode in the middle. 
and they're still going to have a reference solution. So it's very similar to what we saw with that hydrogen ion exchange, except instead of having glass, we've got polymer. And instead of having uh, just H pluses, we now have calcium pluses that are on either side for our, in our ion exchange reservoir. So uh, this is these guys side by side. Their internal filling solutions are either going to be HCl or calcium, depending on what we're trying to measure, right? We're trying to measure calcium, we're going to fill it with calcium. If we're trying to measure H plus, we're going to use H plus. Rather than having a glass membrane, we're going to have this liquid membrane here with a uh, porous membrane with a saturated ion exchanger, and then we got that ion exchange layer instead. Well, um, this is just another representation of that. We can have this uh, membrane. Nafion is really common. You'll see that in electrochemistry and electrodes all the time. Uh, and then you're just going to have an AG electrode. You're going to have a saturated solution of AgCl and calcium chloride. And we got this ion exchanger. Uh, this idea of doing an ion exchanger is also another neat trick. Uh, what you can do with this ion exchange resin is if I'm looking for something like calcium, I can only allow calcium to uh, get through my ion or through my semi-permeable membrane. The ion exchanger is going to work in a way to replace calcium with hydrogen ions. So it binds to this little plastic bead. That plastic bead is then going to generate H plus in response to as many calciums as you get. And then you just make a pH probe and measure the H pluses. So you're Semi-permeable membrane filters out everything except for calcium. Your ion exchanger replaces the calcium with hydrogen, and then you just measure the H plus as you would before. Um, we have some uh, another table that we can talk about these guys. So we can look at calcium, chloride, nitrate, perchlorate, uh, potassium. We have a LOQ range. Sorry, this is all sideways on us here, but pretty low concentrations, right? So down to uh, like a P. Seven times 10 to the minus seven, so re relatively low concentrations. Um, you're going to have some interfering species, right? Lead is going to be lead two plus, iron is iron two plus. And so based on the size and the charge, you're going to have some interfering species that you have to watch out for for any of these. A liquid-based ion selective electrode, calcium ion selective electrode with a liquid ion exchanger, like we just saw. The ion selective membrane consists of a hydrophobic polymer membrane impregnated with a hydrophobic ionophore that is selective to calcium. Same sort of equation that we've seen several times now, where we've got this modified Nernst equation. We have some constant B, that's going to be the slope of our line, or beta here, uh, 0.059 over two, because we've got two electrons that are involved, and then the log of the activity of the calcium, which is on the outside. Uh, we did this in on Mars, where this is not the only planet we've done this on. They did use a liquid-based ion selective electrode to study the pH of the soil on Mars. So the ionophore was liquid-based ion selective electrode pH probes. Uh, it was ETH 2418, so we're going to measure between 1 and 9. Uh, we're looking at potassium and, uh, sorry, we're looking at uh, our uh, potential for hydrogen and sodium and potential interferences for potassium and calcium. This is just the structure of that ionophore. Uh, so how was perchlorate discovered on Mars with one of these ion selective electrodes? One of four wet chem labs on the Phoenix lander. The ion selective electrodes were embedded in the beaker compartment walls to measure ion concentrations. They looked at calcium, magnesium, uh, potassium, nitrate, uh, ammonium, uh, sulfate, uh, chloride, bromide, iodide, and H+. So in the beaker cell wall, so they basically sucked up some soil, they added some water to it, and they're like, hey, what's in here? You can actually lower the detection limits on ion selective electrodes by reducing the concentration of analyte ion in the inner filling solution with metal ion buffer, the lower mobility of primary ion in the ion selective membrane so that the primary ion cannot leak from the inner solution, and you can replace the inner filling solution with an electrically conductive polymer. So basically, instead of having liquid, you got a solid in there. So New guidance for the uh, EPA says that we basically want no lead in tap water, so it should be in 15 parts per billion level. If it's 
above that, then we have to fix it. The old lead ion selective electrode couldn't measure this list. You had to use another technique like inductively coupled plasma optical emission spectroscopy. Um, one of those lead swabs is not going to be able to get that low. So here was a problem that needed to be solved. How am I going to make an easy probe that's going to be cheap and affordable because electrode probes like this are pretty cheap instrumentation? How am I going to get that to the detection limits I need based on what the law says? So they used a buffer solution to lower the concentration of lead in the filling solution from five times 10 to the minus four molar to one times 10 to the minus four molar. And that's going to extend the working range into the new cutoff, right? So your old sensor would go like this and then it would just kind of flatten out. It wouldn't respond too much. But by changing the concentration of that reference solution, you're able to extend that limit of detection down to where the EPA needed it to be. So you've got a nice little table here that's going to tell you what those new uh, limits are. Not super duper important that you guys memorize this. Uh, here's how you can do this by lowering the ion mobility. So you're going to put a vinyl polymer membrane that's going to selectively bind to lead. And diffusion of lead through that membrane is a lot slower than in plasticized membrane. And that's going to give you a much lower detection limit. So what you're doing is you're essentially concentrating the lead inside this polymer. As you build up that concentration, you're building up your charge, which means you're building up your potential. Uh, and so it's able to extend that detection limit down here a little bit more. There's some other neat things you can do. Uh, like you can put biomolecules into your polymer that's on there. Uh, we're going to see all about that when we start talking about glucose sensing, but you can have a substrate, a gold substrate here, and then they've got a self-assembled monolayer with some antibodies on it. As the analyte protein binds to those antibodies, uh, you can then attach, uh, say, another nanoparticle to it. You can oxidize the surface to relate or oxidize the surface and release AG as AG plus, and then you can detect your AG plus. So there's lots of different tricks you can do with electrodes to detect things that you may not think would be readily available for an electrochemical measurement. There are some challenges to using this kind of ion selective electrode. Uh, you don't have a lot of precision. It's probably about 1% or higher. Um, you can foul these things in, with proteins or other organic solutes. Uh, they can drift uh, over time. They can get sluggish. Uh, you can have interference with poison certain electrodes. So if I tried to work with sulfur and I had a silver electrode that's just going to wreck your electrode pretty quick. Um, a lot of these are fragile or have a limited self shelf life. Um, you oftentimes have to hold that ionic strength constant and they're only going to respond to uncomplexed ions. So if you have something where you've got like an AG plus in solution and I've got some ammonia around it, all right, well, those ammonias, this complex is not necessarily going to be seen by that electrode. So, yeah, can you do this? Yeah, you can detect calcium plus in human plasma. Much of the calcium plus in human plasma is complex by other ligands and would ordinarily be invisible to an ion selective electrode based sensor. Other measurement approaches can be used to see all of the calcium, both free and complex, in the plasma. For example, capillary electrophoresis and inductively coupled plasma would work. Uh, the largest peak in there would be free calcium, but that's just using a different method. Okay. Some of our newest and more interesting chemical sensors are the solid